complete our socioeconomic data study for um, the year 2040 as we're developing our 2040 <coughs> long range transportation plan. This is really our first step in developing that transportation plan. Um, uh, Whitney and her uh, team with Transport City have been uh, developing these new uh, socioeconomic data projections for us. Last night they presented information at the uh, Greater Lands Planning Commission and got a couple of questions from them as well because this information and data is also going to be used by that by Lowndes County as we develop um, the Lowndes County uh, comprehensive plan over the next couple of years and other planning efforts that need this population and socioeconomic data. In our surrounding counties like Brooks County, Justin, we also produced county control total uh, population estimates for the year 2040. We didn't go into the specific detail that we did in Lowndes County, but we did produce the hot, the county-wide level totals that you guys will be needing uh, when you look at your uh, long-range plans. So you, the other surrounding counties did get some of that information as well through the MPO. But um, I want to do want to turn it over to Whitney to present this information. Thank you. Again, my name is Whitney Shepard, and I'm here with Dr. Michael Meyer, and uh, we're happy to be here today to talk about population and employment data and projections for your study area. Really, I'd like to start by giving a little background about why we developed the data that we developed and, and what purpose it serves for you all before I get into the numbers. Um, so as you all know, you're here mostly to think about transportation improvements in the region. And um, the reason that you need socioeconomic data to support that is that people and jobs are what creates demand on your transportation network. So um, we think about how many people and how many jobs, uh, when they're going to be in place in your planning area, where they're going to be traveling to, and where they're going to be traveling from. And this is, all, this is also an important step in order to meet federal transportation planning requirements and state regulations. So without this data, uh, you'll, you would fall out of compliance with federal requirements and, and not be able to apply for federal transportation dollars. So that's an important point to make, I think. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're talking about population and employment today. And what we did is start with the latest census, the 2010 census, and then update those figures to today, what's on the ground today, and then looked out to your next required long-range transportation plan horizon, which is in 2040. And then we were asked to develop interim year projections. So we also developed projections for 2015, 2020, and so on out to 2020. And at this point, I do want to point out that this data collection and projection process, along with the visioning that you're, you're um, doing today, are the first couple of steps in a planning process that's going to last a couple of years for you all. So not only the transportation planning, but also the comprehensive planning. And our main deliverable really is a set of spreadsheets. It's several databases um, that we've submitted to staff for review. Um, and we'll be submitting a final data set uh, within this week. Um, again, two main purposes. One is transportation planning. And we really developed the level of detail required for your regional travel demand model. And so the variables that you can see on the left there are everything that's required to be entered into that model. Um, and we also developed more detail on the population and housing side in order to help you all complete your local comprehensive plans. So some of the variables we developed specifically, specifically for comprehensive planning after coordinating with local staff and understanding their needs, and other variables were developed specifically following GDOT's travel demand model guidelines so that we can comply with their model setup and get you all a new updated travel demand model starting in your 2010 base year for your next long range plan. Um, <clears throat> once we, we did work to verify the base year data coming out of the census and make sure that it accurately represents your region. For example, some populations such as students in the military often report their home address outside of where they're actually living. So we certainly did some data checking to make sure that the census really represents who's here every day. Uh, we did the same thing with employment. We checked uh, every major employer as well as um, several smaller employers in the region. We worked with the chamber 
to understand what data they had um, and to verify the Department of Labor data that was made available to us. And once we had those horizon year control totals in 2040, we then distributed all of that growth out to very small areas, both census tracts, census plot groups, and traffic analysis zones, which are the small areas that your travel demand model use. Um, and we did go through a couple of rounds of revisions, both at the control total level and at the growth allocation level. So we've had some staff review and corrections based on their comments, which were very helpful. And finally, we developed the interim year data. And I did want to point out that our study area shown here was the four county area. We developed control totals for all four counties and then looked more closely at the travel demand model area. So you can see all of Lowndes County and slivers in the other three counties that are within your travel demand model boundary. So we developed more detail in those small areas um, than we did for, the, for all four counties. And the comprehensive planning data that I was referring to before. I'm not sure if I mentioned, but that was specifically for Lowndes County and its jurisdictions. Okay, one of our first steps was to look at population projections from various sources so that we weren't just starting from ground zero and thinking about 2040. And I just wanted to point out a couple here. Um, hopefully you can see this. The, the orange line and those dots are what you used in your last round of planning. They were developed by the Department of Community Affairs based on data from 1980 to 2000. So we then updated that base data to 2010 and were able to develop new projections because we had additional data. And that's what you can see um, slightly higher projections shown in red. And the, the source um, that generated the highest projections, which are about 20 to 30 percent year to year, higher than your other sources, were developed by OPB for the state water planning. So you've probably seen those figures before as well. And I do just want to zoom in on what we're recommending that you all use. Um, you can see the last four census population totals in Lowndes County there, and then our trend line, which projects out to 2040 and your future planning horizon. So we're projecting right around 150,000 people in Lowndes County. And when you add to that county total, the three smaller areas in the travel demand model area, then that brings us up to this line. So in 2010, uh, the travel demand model area population is almost 111,000 people, and we're projecting about a 40% increase to 150, almost 155,000 people in the travel demand model area. And again, as you can see, that's based on historic growth patterns. Of course, we had to make a lot of assumptions um, to get from today out to 2040. First of all, is that trend line that you just saw. Secondly, we assumed that housing growth and employment growth would follow the population trend. So essentially that the number of people on average per household and the number of jobs on average per resident would stay consistent over the planning horizon. We also assumed that the distribution of the types of jobs would remain relatively stable over the planning horizon. And um, I'll talk about those last two bullets in the next several slides, showing you the kind of growth that we assumed in the planning area. First of all, though, I'd like to just show you some of the numbers. Um, and this, I believe, is already on the website. Is that right? Or it will be today? It will be today. Okay. So the, the technical report detailing all of this information uh, will be on the website. Um, but you can see here the the control totals by county and then for the small areas that are within the model area boundary and the four employment categories that are input into the travel demand model um, and the households. And so again, we assumed that the population trend would drive the growth in employment and housing. And this shows the change over time from 2010 to 2040 in those same categories to give you a sense of the growth um, for the entire model region. Again, about a 40% increase in population. So I mentioned the growth areas, and, and when we're looking at distributing the increase from 2010 to 2040 in population and jobs, it's important to think about what development patterns will be happening in the region, and we were really fortunate to have staff's help in developing this growth area map. 
Um, and this shows projected growth areas by type, essentially by land use, whether that be residential, commercial, industrial, or institutional growth. Um, it also included data on the time frame for likely development in fairly vague amounts, short range, mid range, long range. We didn't pinpoint a specific year, but we did have data about you know, what you all think the time frame for development would be. And we use this information to develop those interim year projections that I mentioned, the, the projections for every five years. And we were also given some information on the likely capacity or intensity of development in each of these growth areas. So where you see a darker region, those are the most intense projected developments. And when we allocated people and jobs to these areas, we did so based on all these characteristics of the growth areas, the time frame of development, the likely land use, and the intensity or density of these developments. So to walk you through sort of step by step, what our process was, was absolutely a GIS-based process. We used ArcMap. First, we looked at land that's already developed or is undevelopable or not suitable for development in your region because it's conservation land use. Um, and we took into account whether or not some of that existing developed land might be available for redevelopment and then generated a layer of land that will be suitable for development between 2010 and 2040. We then overlaid those growth areas that you just saw on that land that's suitable for development so we could take a look at what kinds of land uses might be occurring and then overlaid our small area boundaries on that layer so that we could allocate population and employment by small area. And I'll give you a quick example of what that looks like in one traffic analysis zone. So here's one zone, happens to be zone 244 in your planning area, and you can see that small boundary that we first overlaid on the growth areas, and then determine what land was suitable for development within the zone, and then assign the growth area to that land. And then we also took a look at some other parameters, and what this shows is land area with access to existing water and sewer service, because we did want to consider other drivers and growth in your region. So once we get to this point, we calculate the number of acres by zone within each of those categories, and then we can assign population and employment based on the number of acres in each category. And uh, the next several slides are just the results. This is your base year population by traffic analysis zone. Um, of course, these zones are all different sizes, so the larger zones are often darker. I think it's more useful to look at the density. This is your base year population density, gross density. And you can see the change to 2040, where we have housing, primarily along your major corridors, increasing. And that makes sense if you go back to the growth area map. Yes, sir. I have one question. Is that, is that mostly on the north, rather, north, north of the county? Uh, this is the entire county? Yes. Is that the top side, is that the north of the county? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to 2010 and then forward to 2040, you can see how the population was assigned to these residential growth areas that are shown in yellow on this map. And next you'll see the base year employment density, again jobs per acre, and how that increases based on the growth areas out to 2040. I'll just do that again real quick so you can see. So where there are industrial, commercial, and institutional growth areas are where jobs primarily were assigned uh, to increase between 2010 and 2040. Uh, as we were iterating through our assumptions and checking the impacts on control totals and the distribution of employment and population, we did um, find some interesting things happening. First of all, your growth areas for the most part can accommodate all of the growth we projected out to 2040. We did end up assigning some service jobs, service being the largest uh, employment category, to areas outside of the identified growth areas, but we assigned them only to those areas with existing access to water and sewer service and that have appropriate zoning. So we went back to the zoning to make sure it was appropriate to design, assign some employment to areas outside of growth areas. Um, and we, we assumed a very small amount of households would also be developed where there is existing access to water and sewer service and residential zoning is already in place. 
And finally, uh, we found that the industrial growth areas that you've already identified have more than enough area in them to accommodate the warehousing and wholesale jobs, manufacturing and wholesale jobs that we've projected out to 2040. So there, if there's likely to be some industrial growth occurring after 2040 in those areas. I did want to make just a few recommendations for you all as you move forward in the planning process. One is that um, you're likely to, to be faced with a local update of census addresses and have the opportunity to take a look at some of your census boundaries. And I do recommend that you go through a review of those census boundaries and make sure that they best reflect uh, your physical reality on the ground and then try to better align your traffic analysis zone boundaries with the census boundaries. First of all, that's an opportunity to make sure the census takes a, as accurate an account as they can in your area, but also it will facilitate your transportation planning moving forward because there are just a few areas in the region where the traffic analysis zone boundaries don't currently follow census boundaries. Um, secondly, that as you're moving forward in both your comprehensive planning and your transportation plans, you take a look at those growth areas and use that as an opportunity to reevaluate them and make sure they still represent uh, what you all have uh, is your desired vision for the area. And since you're revalidating your travel demand model, the MPO's model, it's certainly an opportunity to use that to develop some measures based on, based on various growth areas. It may be that you want to take a look at, for example, those industrial areas and prioritize which might grow faster, or that you want to evaluate um, different assumptions using the model, and it's a very good tool for that. Um, and I would also just recommend that you continue your, your very strong coordination with your major employers in the region because um, having data available for major employers certainly helped us in this process and it should continue to help you into the future. And with that, I will thank you and open it up for questions.